Good day. I'm Max Hegwa, Editor-in-Chief of FEMS Microbiology Ecology, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on ecology of soil microorganisms. Our webinar series enable us to highlight different topics of microbial ecology to a broad audience. Those of you who have tuned in to our previous webinars knows that FEMS, the Federation of European Microbiological Science Societies, invests in science. We use the income from our journals to fund charitable activities and support our community. It is important to note that learned societies and their journals provide grants to scientists, organize and support conferences and summer schools, and sponsor a range of events, such as this webinar series, which provides a forum for the presentation and discussion of key research, enabling the flow of ideas to a worldwide audience. As an author, when you publish in FEMS journals, and when as a reader, you use these publications, you directly support the various activities in which FEMS invests back in science. As editor-in-chief, one of my rewarding tasks is to select topics and speakers for these webinars from our collection of papers. Note also that if you missed some of our earlier webinars, they are available via the FEMS OUP websites. Indeed, before we start, I wish to thank the staff of FEMS and Oxford University Press for all their work behind the scenes in making these webinars happen. Also a big change for the journal is that from January 2024, the journal will be fully open access. This means that all the archives will also be available free to read regardless of your institutional subscriptions. In addition, to ensure that article processing charges do not become a barrier for authors, there are a number of discounts and waivers available, so please check the website for more detail on this. Today, our three speakers will take us on a captivating journey into the ecology of soil microorganisms and learn how soil bacteria and fungi respond to stress conditions, habitat restoration, and changing climates. Our three expert speakers will unveil some of the adaptations and roles of microorganisms in regulating soil ecosystems. First, Emily Sully from the Department of Environmental System Science at ETH Zurich, and now at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig, will discuss the impact of water limitation on soil microbial communities involved in nutrient cycle. Then, Nicholas Barber from the Department of Biology at San Diego State University will discuss the restoration and age and reintroduce bison and how they may shape soil bacterial communities in restored tall grass prairies. And finally, Ana Escalanta from Instituto de Ecologia in Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México will present on the functional significance of microbial diversity in arid soils. After the talks, we will open the session for your questions and for discussion. So please submit your questions and comments via the Q&A link, and we will get back to these at the end of the session. Also to note before we get started that if you're interested in learning more about the ecology of soil microorganisms. We have a thematic issue on this topic coming up in early 2024. So again, take a look at the journal website. But now it's my pleasure to introduce Emily Sully, uh, our first speaker, and she'll get us into nutrient cycling in soils. So Emily, welcome. Hello, everybody. I will share my screen. Uh, thank you very much, Max, for the nice introduction and also for inviting us to present uh, our work in the FEMS Microbiology Ecology uh, webinar today. I will talk about the impact of water limitation on soil bacterial and fungal communities involved in nutrient cycling in Scott's Pine mesocosms. And I would, uh, first of all, like to thank also my co-authors, in particular Astrid Jaeger, who did the assessment of the microbiome uh, for this study. So you might be wondering why were we interested in understanding the impacts of water limitation on the microbiome in the soils associated specifically with Scott's pine trees? 
Um, the reason for this is that um, climate change is uh, predicted to uh, continuously increase the, fr the frequency and severity of drought periods, uh, mainly due to the continuing uh, increases uh, in temperatures. And this is unfortunately lead to, leading to uh, several episodes of tree mortality, which have been recorded at many sites globally. Also in Central European Alps, several in several regions, episodes of tree mortality have been recorded, um, where the dominant species is Scots pine, Pinus silvestris. Uh, and also uh, reductions in tree growth and vitality have been observed in the southwest of Switzerland that you can see this area marked in red in the, in the map. Uh, here, also from the figures, you can see that the forest is not doing well. Scots pine trees have actually been suffering from drought. And you can see from the pictures that the trees in orange uh, are, are actually dying. Not uh, This is not in autumn, so they're not discoloring because of, of autumn but, and seasonality, but really because uh, they're suffering from drought and, and, and losing vitality. Uh, the Valais, the Canton Valais, is a very dry area of Switzerland and uh, also in general of the European Alps, uh, mainly because the mountains are blocking the air masses. And so uh, this results in lower precipitation in comparison to other areas. Uh, in this uh, Canton Valais, uh, the precipitation has not really been changing over time. However, the temperatures have been increasing. And so mainly uh, the loss of water through evaporation from the soil has caused uh, tree mortality uh, episodes during the last decades. And the situation, uh, unfortunately, seems not to be improving until the end of the next, next century. Predictions of climate change are actually uh, indicating that the temperatures will continue to increase without um, what, um, some efforts, mitigation efforts, by four to seven degrees. Um, and pro possibly also during summer, the precipitation rates will be reduced by 40%. And this is, of course, very problematic for forest uh, functioning because uh, trees also sustain uh, ecosystem services. Uh, for instance, especially in mountainous areas, they protect uh, against rockfall, avalanches, and soil erosion. Also, not only mature trees are dying, but also very young trees which are developing in the forest uh, due to drought. And therefore, it is important uh, to, to understand how young trees are also uh, resistant to water limitation, to understand how forests can actually recover uh, after extreme events of drought. Um, drought and water limitation doesn't only uh, affect uh, trees, but it also uh, can influence the soil microbiome. In forest, organisms such as fungi, bacteria, archaea, or protists actually play key uh, functions uh, such as decomposition, nutrient cycling, and uh, symbiosis with trees. And um, an alteration of the soil microbiome due to drought uh, might also lead to, to then uh, influences, uh, negative influences on soil health and on nutrient cycling. Water limitation does not only affect the soil microbiome directly, but it can also alter the soil microbiome through changes in uh, physical chemical properties in soils and through altered plant parameters. For instance, uh, due to water limitation, plants can undergo a series of physiological changes. Uh, for instance, they, uh, they probably alter the amount of, uh, of inputs and the chemistry of the inputs to the soil, which are very important uh, and, and very important energy source for soil microbial communities, and also changes in their growth. Uh, for instance, an, an alteration in the root growth, usually uh, the growth of trees is reduced due to water limitation, can also affect the amount of uh, exudates released to the soil which can in turn uh, induce shifts in the, both in the, in the functioning of the microbiome, but also in the community composition. So uh, the main uh, aim of uh, our study was to assess the response of soil prokaryotes uh, and fungal communities to different levels of experimental water limitation in Scott's spine mesocosms. And we were also under, interested in understanding how um, changes in uh, soil physical chemical properties and uh, plant growth would affect the soil microbiome. 
We hypothesized that water limitation and other resource abilities uh, would uh, induce a community succession towards uh, an enhanced abundance of uh, sapiotrophic taxa involved uh, in the decomposition, degradation of uh, organic matter derived from plants, so dead organic matter from plants. Um, at the same time, we expected that water limitation would decrease in biotic taxa and uh, rather increase oligotrophic bacteria and desiccation tolerant taxa under water limitation. Finally, we also uh, expected the composition of the soil fungal community uh, to be um, more resistant uh, to water limitation as com in compared to prokaryotic communities, mainly due to the ability of fungal communities to produce high full network, uh, which allow fungi to basically scavenge uh, larger areas of the soil for nutrients and, uh, and water, of course. So, to answer these, uh, to, to basically tackle these hypotheses, we set up a mesocosm experiment in the greenhouses of ETH Zurich in Switzerland. Um, we set up 18 mesocosms. Uh, you can see in quite large pots, uh, as you can see from the image here. And uh, the soils were filled with natural forest soil from the forest that you have uh, seen before in one of my slides, uh, affected by uh, drought uh, during the last decades. And also the tree seedlings that we, or saplings that we that we planted here had uh, an age of three years at the time of the, of the start of the experiment. And um, the experiment was set up uh, in September, 2019. And then we, uh, we basically uh, watered, uh, we irrigated the mesocosms uh, to field capacity. Uh, in order for four months in order to the for the mesocosms to basically um, acclimate the new conditions in the in the greenhouse and after this period we then started the, the irrigation treatments we had three treatments a control treatment which was uh, uh, for which the mesocosms were maintained at field capacity and then we had two uh, water limitation treatments an intermediate and a severe water limitation treatment, for which the amount of water was reduced by 40 and 75%. Uh, after the start of the treatments, we then um, sampled on a seasonal basis, and we analyzed uh, all sorts of parameters uh, for the soils and for the plants, for instance, pH, nutrients in the soil, but also growth of the plants and gas exchange. And we, of course, also uh, analyzed uh, and assessed the soil microbiome using DNA sequences, sequencing and uh, the qPCR method for the quantification of fungal and bacterial ribosomal markers. And I would like to mention again that uh, the analysis of the microbiome was done by uh, Astrid Jaeger, who was the PhD involved with the project. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, she could not uh, uh, attend the seminar today, and this is why I am presenting. Um, as you can see from this graph, we did a very good job with the, with the treatment, so that at the beginning of the experiment, all of the treatments had basically the same um, gravimetric water content in the soil. Um, and after the start of the irrigation treatments, uh, the amount of water in the soil start, started to decrease for the water limitation treatments as compared to the control. And we always had the, the lowest amount of water in the severe water limitation treatment. You can also see in the graph that there was a seasonal variation um, over time. And this is because there is a confounding effect of uh, uh, temperature on soil moisture. When the temperatures are higher in summer, we regulated the temperatures uh, manually in the greenhouse to basically follow a seasonal pattern. And during uh, warmer temperatures uh, in summer, then uh, there's higher evaporation from the soil and also higher evapotranspiration by the trees. And this is why the amount of water in the soil uh, also decreases. Nevertheless, the amount of water in the control treatment was higher as compared to the water limiting treatment. You can also see that it was a bit more variable. Um, one year of water limitation, very interestingly, did not alter the relative abundance of uh, either neither the prokaryotic uh, and fungal communities in the soils. 
um, over the whole course of the experiment. Nevertheless, we did see a peak of uh, abundance for both communities in summer. And um, this could be likely because of the temperatures might uh, stimulate uh, the growth of uh, organisms which are uh, uh, favoring uh, high temperatures, which grow better under high temperatures. But it could also be related to the fact that plants uh, continue to sustain their growth during the growing season. And so the, um, the higher input also of carbon by the plant, which were continue to have the sustained growth, might have also acted as a good energy source for the microbial communities, especially during summer. Nevertheless, uh, water limitation uh, had a very strong impact on the community composition uh, in the soils of the, of the mesocosms. Here you can see the cap analysis, the um, for the prokaryotic community, and uh, you can see that basically um, the prokaryotic community uh, strongly diverged among treatments. Uh, this you can see um, from the first, from the second axis, the y-axis, that there was a very strong diversification among treatments, and that this diversification actually increased along the course of the experiment. Um, towards the end of, exper of the experiment, uh, in, uh, that you can see towards the right side of the graph, uh, so in the second winter of the mesocosm study, uh, also the reclassification values of the CAP analysis were much higher, uh, also indicating that basically there was a diversification over time for the prokaryotic community. Instead, uh, the fungal community did not show a very clear pattern, uh, neither for the treatments nor for the seasonality uh, or for the sampling times uh, during the different season of the experiment. And also you can see that the reclassification values were quite low, usually lower than 50%. Uh, so we cannot basically say that there was a, a diversification of the fungal community uh, for the treatments. And so, this basically implies also that uh, the fungal community is less sensitive to um, the conditions that we had in, in the mesocosms in particular, uh, it was less sensitive to water limitation as compared to prokaryotic communities. And uh, we relate this uh, pattern mainly to the ability of fungi to basically uh, create this large uh, hypho network to basically scavenge for nutrients and water uh, uh, over longer distances in the soil. Similar and supporting results were also obtained by the Bipartit Association network analysis that we did. Here you can see the graph uh, of the network for the prokaryotic community. Basically, uh, the network uh, which I show is um, indicating the the clustering of, uh, of communities according to treatment, so irrigation treatment and sampling time. And you can see very nicely that there was a very clear separation of the treatments for the prokaryotic community. Also, uh, you cannot see uh, from the graph that on the right side where we had the, um, the severe water limitation uh, treatment in brown, that uh, the community composition was mainly dominated by actinobacteriota. And uh, this makes sense because uh, this, uh, this type of organisms are actually known to be um, very resistant to water limitation, tolerant, and also good decomposers of organic matter. So, so when there's maybe less uh, easily available carbon to be used, they can also decompose uh, more difficult and complex organic matter. On the other hand, we didn't observe the same pattern for the fungal community composition. Um, or sorry, not composition, for the fungal community. Um, in fact, you can see that there was no clear effect of treatment, or at least this was less evident from uh, the bipartite association network. And um, you can also uh, see from the colors um, that uh, the community of the fungi was mainly dominated by Ascomycota. Um, so again, uh, it seems from the from this analysis 
uh, quite clearly that prokaryotic communities are more uh, sensitive to water limitation as compared to fungal communities in soils. Um, we also did an indicator species, species analysis. And uh, as you can see quite nicely from this graph, uh, some um, tax, uh, some groups of uh, microbes increase with uh, water limitation while, while others decrease. Um, so I would like to start with the uh, group of, uh, with, with the tax which actually increase with water limitation as these were not so many. And you can see this at the bottom of the graph. You can see that we observed an increase in actinobacteriota as mentioned earlier, we also saw a lot of uh, the, the purple dots uh, close to the severe water limitation uh, nodes. And um, these are, again, known to be desiccation tolerant and decomposers of organic matter. We also saw an uh, increase with water limitation of thermoplasma tota, which are organisms which are also found in extreme environments. Um, the taxa which uh, were uh, mostly affected, uh, as you can see from this graph from water limitation, were appear to be mucoromycota, which are well-known symbionts of plants and which rely on carbon inputs from the host tree, so probably under drought there was less uh, available carbon directly from the trees, and this is why they, they reduced their uh, relative abundance and their water limitation. At the same time, nitrospirota, which is a taxa which involved in nitrogen cycling, also in, uh, was reduced in relative abundance in our study. Uh, we also observed that at the general, general level, we observed that there was an increase in desiccation tolerant and saprotrophic fungal um, um, organisms. And um, we also observed a decrease of genera involved in nitrogen fixation and of symbiotic genera. So overall, uh, we observed quite a strong uh, change in in uh, in in those uh, in 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 the community composition of uh, our soils. Also, uh, physical chemical soil properties strongly uh, played a role on the on altering the composition uh, of the fungal of the fungal and prokaryotic community in our study. Uh, as you can see from this graph, um, both prokaryotes and fungi were strongly affected by gravimetric water content, soil temperature, as I have already widely discussed during the presentation, but also uh, in changes in total nitrogen, pH, and, uh, and soil organic carbon concentrations. And just to give you an idea, the pH basically was higher at the beginning of the experiment and then the pH declined over time. Um, it remained more basic uh, for the control treatment as compared to the other treatments. And we also observed that um, the pH was strong, more strongly affecting the, uh, the prokaryotic community as compared to the fungal community. And we also observed uh, clear changes, um, or like small changes in organic carbon and uh, total nitrogen uh, concentration, the nitrogen rather declined uh, during the course of the experiment, which also led to an uh, um, increase in the CN ratio of the soil, which also uh, likely played a role in uh, shaping the microbial community composition. So this is already my uh, conclusion slide, and I would like to to summarize a bit uh, the results that I showed you, you know, during the presentation, we observed that uh, water limitation basically did not affect the relative abundance uh, of neither the prokaryotic nor the fungal community composition during the course of the experiment. We only observed a peak during the summer season. We also observed that fungal communities were less sensitive as compared to prokaryotic communities uh, in response uh, to uh, changes in soil moisture contents. Um, we also observed that uh, the diversification of prokaryotic communities was gradual and rather was uh, very marked at the, uh, towards the end. And um, water limitation overall promoted the proliferation of microbial groups, which were tolerant to environmental stress, uh, such as uh, saprotrophic taxa, and uh, rather in induced a decrease in uh, those uh, taxa, which were um, 
uh, involved with nutrient cycling and also plant symbionts. And so overall water limitation uh, will likely have potential um, effects on the soil microbiome of, uh, of uh, Scots Pine forests and will uh, likely um, affect uh, the functioning of forests due to changes in the critical functions which are provided by soil microbial communities. And with this, I would like to thank all of the people which were involved in the project, the Swiss National Science Foundation for the funding of my Ambizione project. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and again, Max, for inviting us to present our work. Thank you, Emily. Uh, really interesting. I already have a whole bunch of questions to get back to, but we will wait till the end and uh, continue with the session. So. Thank you. And just a note to everybody, I think Zoom has gone into AI mode and is loving these webinars and the talks and sending applause and reactions all over the screen. And they are not being turned off. Unfortunately, there's some glitch here in the system. So please go to your own reactions uh, arrow and you can hide the uh, the various reactions that, that seem to be just popping up to the very nice talks that are going. So again, we'll come back to the Q&A uh, uh, later. So thank you, Emily. So our next speaker is uh, Nicholas Barber from San Diego State University, and he's working on a really interesting system on reintroduced uh, bison to tall grass prairies and how this shift is now changing so bacterial communities and their functions. So uh, Nicholas, welcome. Um, thanks so much, Max. Thanks for inviting me. Um, thanks to everyone for, for joining around the world today. Um, that was a really fascinating talk, Emily. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to hearing from Anna as well. Um, one thing I'll start with is that when Max invited me for this webinar, I was, I was honored and excited, but I wanted to make sure he knew I'm not really a microbiologist. I came to this work very much from the ecology side. Um, I'm a community ecologist. I've worked a lot with plant and insect communities to understand the forces that shape their communities. Uh, but I began collaborating with microbiologists, especially Wes Swingley, shown here at the bottom. And this paper I'll talk about today was in collaboration with him and other members of his lab, Des Klimek, who was a master's student, and Jennifer Bell, who was a postdoc. Um, and this paper also sort of grew out of COVID times. When we went into lockdown in 2020, I had to cancel plans to spend the summer doing research in Germany and, and was stuck at home, but I was sort of fortunate and privileged to have a lot of flexibility without all well, the challenges and responsibilities that a lot of our colleagues faced. So I, I was able, able to take the opportunity to learn how to work with Amplicon data, and this, this paper grew out of that. So I'll actually start with the ecosystem to frame this study and the questions we asked. To orient everyone, here's the lower 48 states of the US. I'm way over here on the West Coast in San Diego. Um, and this work took place a little west of Chicago in the U.S. state of Illinois, where you see this red star. Um, and in much of this region of the central U.S., if you go outside of cities into the surrounding countryside, most of it looks like this. Um, Large-scale agriculture, primarily a rotation of corn or maize and soybean. But if you were to take a time machine back 150 or 200 years, it would, it would probably look more like this. Most of the center of North America the Great Plains was grasslands. And this includes the eastern mesic regions of grasslands called the, the tall grass prairie, this enormous ecosystem stretching in a broad band from what's now southern Canada to what's now Texas and eastward toward the US Canadian Great Lakes. This is one estimate of its extent. These maps vary a little depending on the exact definition of the habitat. It's a highly diverse ecosystem with high plant diversity, high plant, uh, high, a lot of characteristic animals. But like lots of grasslands around the world, um, this ecosystem, which had deep, rich soils in combination with generally high rainfall, especially in that eastern part of the prairie, made it ideal agricultural land. Uh, and so by the mid 20th century, much of it was converted to row crop agriculture, something like 90% of the habitat lost. And most of the remaining remnant or relic prairies are, are tiny patches of land, mostly too small to be seen on a map like this which makes it one of the most endangered habitats in North America. So then by the start of the 21st century, um, prairies have really become important targets of ecosystem restoration to try and reestablish uh, prairies, support their unique biodiversity, their functions, 
and services. So uh, former farm fields are planted with a mix of native seeds to regrow um, these diverse grassland plant communities. But it still requires a lot of ongoing management, um, including control of invasive weeds. And importantly for my talk today, it also requires the application of regular disturbances. Uh, two of these common disturbances are fire and grazing. Prescribed fire, like you see here, is applied frequently, um, anywhere from annually to every few years. Because in the absence of fire that, that, that suppresses woody plants, most tall grass prairies will grow up and no longer be prairies. Um, if you saw Ari Yumpanen's talk in this webinar series last year, you saw an example of this. Um, this fire uh, mimics historical fires from lightning strikes, but also importantly, it mimics the fires that were set as land stewardship by American Indian tribes who used fire as a cultural practice to maintain the land on which they lived. Uh, the work I'm talking about today took place uh, in a region that's the traditional land of multiple tribes, including the Peoria, Potawatomi, Ochetisakawan, Miami, Kickapoo, Sauk, and Meskwaki people who all lived on and helped to shape these lands. The other important disturbance is grazing by large mammals. Um, historically, large herds of grazing bison inhabited the Great Plains, uh, but were hunted nearly to extinction. In the absence of grazing disturbance, many restored prairies lose plant species richness over time. Um, although many species may initially establish over uh, a decade or two, a lot of them don't persist and are often outcompeted by large high biomass grasses. But those grasses are often preferred food by bison. So bison reintroduction to restored prairies may be able to, uh, able to maintain uh, higher plant species richness by suppressing those grasses um, and by adding heterogeneity to the environment through their activities like grazing and trampling, wallowing and depositing dung and urine. So a number of large prairie restoration projects have reintroduced bison over the years, um, but it's a really big undertaking because of the resources needed. So a lot of effort then goes into reestablishing these prairies and a lot of ongoing maintenance and management. Um, but restoration is often focused on, on plants and animals, um, even though, as we all know, soil microbes are a critical part of the system, um, especially when restoring function as part of the, the overall goals. Um, that importance is underscored by how much plant biomass is, uh, is below ground uh, in, by roots in the soil that can go meters down, as shown in this famous photo by Jim Richardson. And yet a lot of management choices are made based on the above ground portion of communities with the assumption that a diverse plant community means diverse assemblages of other organisms. So in this study, we looked at soil bacteria and asked the question, how do diversity and composition of these communities change following prairie restoration and potentially in response to management disturbances from prescribed fire and the presence of these reintroduced bison? Uh, we worked at Nachusa Grasslands, uh, a large ecosystem restoration project owned and operated by the Nature Conservancy uh, that includes original unplowed prairie remnants uh, and where the staff and volunteers have been carrying out restoration since the mid-1980s. Each year they, they plant new sites, usually former ag fields, and they're slowly expanding the reserve. Uh, and the methods they use are really helpful for scientists because they use very consistent methods to seed and manage these sites with regular weed control and prescribed fire, all on very similar soil textures. So near the end of 2014, then they introduced a herd of bison into a, a large fenced unit um, covering about half of the preserve. And within it were a range of remnant and restored prairie sites, which the bison had free access to. So we took advantage of this to choose a set of focal restorations that varied in age, planted from 1987 to 2013, uh, and they varied in bison access. The blue sites here show where bison have access, and yellow they don't. Uh, and we also selected uh, two large remnants, shown in red, and two nearby agricultural fields, the green striped areas. Um, and these are, again, rotated between corn and soy. All the prairie sites, but not the farm fields, get prescribed fire. Um, the schedule varies a little, but on average, it's about every second year. Uh, we began sampling these sites in the fall of 2013, um, and then spring, summer, and fall sampling from 2014 through 2018, taking surface soil uh, that we pooled together from each site. So we had a corona sequence of sites from newly planted to over 25 years old at the start, and we repeatedly sampled these sites so we could see how they changed individually over time and in burn versus unburned years. Um, also, the bison were introduced after we completed our 2014 sampling, so we have pre and post bison samples for those units. 
Uh, from these soil samples, we measured basic abiotic variables, uh, and then we targeted 16S ribosomal RNA uh, genes using a CHIME2 and DOTA2 pipelines to, uh, to process the sequences and assign taxonomy. Um, in this study, we collapsed tax at a genus level to calculate community metrics for each sample. I'll, I'll show results today for alpha diversity uh, and for community composition based on beta diversity. So looking at our results, um, let me first orient you to these next uh, few figures, starting with soil characteristics. This is showing carbon nitrogen ratio of soil in restorations only, just, just in the replanted prairies. I'm plotted here against the age of those restored prairies. In all the figures I'm about to show, there was a significant quadratic relationship with age. So here in the years following replanting, these former ag fields gain soil carbon and probably lose some nitrogen that's remaining from a, a legacy of fertilization. Um, and the ratio is also slightly higher with bison present. Um, those are all, like I said, restorations. Looking at overall mean values and comparing them to ag fields and to remnants, um, you can see carbon nitrogen ratio seems a little higher in remnants, the yellow point here, but the effect wasn't significant. There's a similar overall pattern for soil pH, and in this case, ag fields have a, have a higher soil pH than the, either of the other uh, prairie site types. So then do these differences in soil conditions with age and bison translate to differences in, uh, in prokaryotic diversity? Kind of. Uh, again, this hump-shaped pattern for both richness and Shannon diversity suggesting soil diversity increases after restoration to a point and then declines in the oldest plantings, uh, sort of like the, the plant richness decline that we see in older communities. Um, here, however, the, that apparent impact of bison on soil abiotic conditions doesn't translate to differences in microbial diversity, only age effects were present. Uh, and then if we look at site type on the right side of each figure, there's also lower richness and lower diversity in remnants. So that decline in older restorations is actually making them more similar to these low diversity remnant soils. Um, now this is all alpha diversity. Um, what about composition? One issue is that the sites with bison access include both the youngest and the oldest restorations at the sites. Uh, and these represent two very different site histories then. In the case of older sites, they're well-established restorations, decades old, to which a new disturbance was added when bison were brought in. And for young restorations, these sites went through some of their earliest development uh, with bison present. Those years shortly after planting, when we see a lot of plant community composition changes as these long-lived perennial plants establish and spread. Um, and from earlier week, we suspected that soil microbial communities are, are also going through a lot of turnover in these early years. But we didn't know whether that turnover would change um, with this new eating, stomping, rolling, pooping disturbance out on the prairie. Here's an ordination uh, from principal coordinates analysis of restoration samples. So no remnants or ag fields here from just this 2013, 2014 samples pre bison. Each circle is a sample. And if you can see the number in each circle, it's the age of the restoration in years. So here, these are sites sampled before bison were introduced, just noting where they would be occurring eventually in light and dark green, uh, and samples in the sites that would remain bison-free in gold. At the start, without bison, young sites, one to three years since planting in the, in the light green here, were definitely distinct, which, which confirms some of our earlier work, while all the older sites, five or more years older, are clustered together. So the question then is what happens as these young sites get older with bison impacts present. What's going to happen to them? Um, we can hypothesize different outcomes in the following years. One possibility is that succession over time is a really dominant factor. Um, our previous work before bison showed up uh, showed that age is a, a strong gradient. So maybe over time, the younger bison sites will just converge with the other site types. And there's a typical prairie soil microbiome composition. Or maybe bison are really big drivers acting as a filter for which microbes thrive or don't, and the, the older and younger bison sites will converge. So there ends up being distinct bison and non-bison soil communities. Or maybe both age and bison are drivers, as I suggested earlier, uh, and bison could shift the trajectory of successional change, resulting in uh, bison sites being distinct and the compositions between younger and older bison sites, again, still being distinct. So going back to the, the pre-bison conditions, what happened in the following years? Um, this is the first growing season after bison were introduced in 2015, then 2016, 2017. 
And then in 2018, when bison had been present for three or four growing seasons, we do start to perhaps see three different compositions like that third hypothesis. Uh, but as additional support for that third hypothesis, uh, bear with me as I jump back to the, the pre-bison communities. Here, uh, the young sites on the right are one to three years old, while just slightly older restoration, older restorations marked with red stars are, are five, six, seven years old, but are compositionally similar to much older 10 to 20 year old sites. And yet by 2018, when those young bison sites on the right in light green here are themselves five, six, seven years old, they're remaining distinct, suggesting that bison impacts really might be playing a role in changing the succession and the outcomes of these restoration activities. So we also looked then at which taxa might be driving these changes we see. Um, the work I'll talk about here was, was led by Wes Swingley using a, a machine learning approach to identify taxa with higher average information gain uh, for random forest decision trees, either across years or following bison introduction. And then we could example uh, examine the relative abundances of those taxa in relation to the, the three site groupings. I'll just point out a, a few interesting highlights. Uh, first, a few taxa were more abundant in these younger bison sites than at the old sites. Here's two examples, an alpha proteobacterium and a beta proteobacterium. Uh, this one on the uh, on the left here, LN6067, is particularly interesting. It's a member of the Nitrosomonidaceae. It's been documented in other tall grass soils, as well as uh, increasing in abundance along pH gradients. And we did see increasing pH over time in those young bison sites. Um, but like many Nitrosomonidaceae, there also uh, are many of them are, are ammonia oxidizers that respond positively to fertilization. And this alpha proteobacterium and the micropepsaceae um, is also abundant with fertilizers, but there's no longer any fertilization in these sites, uh, except for the possibility that bison dung and urine deposition could be in the right form and maybe a sufficient amount to subsidize these microbes. There were also taxa that were generally uh, lower, that were significantly lower in, um, there we go in uh, relative abundance in the young bison sites. Here's uh, three genera following that pattern, all in the actinobacteria. These genera, these genera have all been found in other grasslands too and found to be rare in cultivated soils or under heavy grazing. Um, they also seem to prefer nutrient poor soils, which might be what these soils look like after that legacy of fertilization goes away. So some general conclusions from our results and, and what they tell us perhaps about grassland restoration. As uh, restorations get older, their soil bacterial diversity becomes more similar to the, to the lower diversity in remnants. Uh, bison don't have consistent effects on alpha diversity, but they do seem to influence uh, composition. And prescribed fire had very uh, little effect, maybe because all these prairies receive regular fire and rarely go more than two or three years without being burned. Uh, one implication for restoration practice is that reserves that include sites with a variety of conditions, different ages, uh, differences in bison presence or absence across those ages, uh, will likely lead to high beta diversity within the whole reserve because bison can drive that environmental heterogeneity, um, which might maybe support greater overall diversity at the full reserve scale and enhance function and stability at that full ecosystem level. But a, a couple other questions came up from this work. Um, first, we use 16S sequences looking just at, at taxonomic composition. Um, we can ask, do these taxonomic differences actually translate into differences in functional potential of these microbes? And we're only looking at prokaryotes. What about fungi, which uh, obviously, and we saw in, in Emily's talk, are a big part of soil communities. Um, we've actually been able to address some of that in some additional work. From our 2017 samples, we selected the, the spring, summer, and fall samples from six restorations. And then the samples in spring, summer, fall from uh, the two remnants and the two ag fields. And then thanks to a community sequencing program grant from the Joint Genome Institute, we're able to get 30 soil metagenomes um, using whole genome shotgun sequencing. Uh, from these, we got both taxonomic classifications and functional potential using the, the CAG lithology database. Um, and again, using both, including both prokaryotes and fungi. Um, and I'm happy to say the results of this study were just published a few weeks ago uh, in FEMS Microbiology Ecology. The QR code here can link you to the paper. Uh, I want to acknowledge the lead author of this paper, Kayla Mason. Um, this paper was based on her master's thesis here at San Diego State. 
I won't take too much time, um, but just as a, a quick couple quick highlights to, uh, for some of the relevant findings in this new paper. First, these ordinations here are depictions of uh, taxonomic composition at the top panel and functional composition based on keg ortholog counts in the bottom panel. Blue dots are restorations, green are remnants, and brown are the ag fields. It's clear the taxonomic distinctiveness between the three site types uh, is also reflected in their functional potential so that we might expect these different communities to support different soil functions too. Uh, as one example of that, when we, when we look at genes encoding uh, enzymes associated with cellulose degradation, we see they're significantly higher in restored prairies, uh, in particular are more abundant just after prescribed fire, similar to what's uh, been seen in some forest systems after fire takes place. Um, there's a lot more in this paper. I encourage you to check it out if you have time. And finally, I want to emphasize how much uh, support we've had in this work, especially from the staff and crew at Nechusa, uh, including Dr. Elizabeth Bach, who is the staff ecologist and an incredibly knowledgeable soil scientist. Uh, we've had lots of helpers in the field to collect soil over the years and in the lab work. Um, and this paper really benefited from helpful feedback from colleagues as well as editors and reviewers at FEMS. Um, and our financial support over the years came from several funding sources. So I'm looking forward now to hearing Anna's talk as well and to our panel discussion afterwards. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. Really, really interesting. And we'll follow up. Uh, there's already a bunch of, of questions uh, waiting in the Q&A. So let's move forward to Ana Escalante from uh, uh, Mexico City. And uh, again, looking at arid soils and what is the functional significance and microbial diversity, what's happening with, of course, now climate change, more and more uh, reduction in, in, uh, in precipitation as well. So um, Ana, thank you. Thank you, Max, and thank you for the invitation. I'm, uh, I'm really honored to be here today, and thank you to the, all the attendees that are listening. Uh, well, I will uh, just start. Uh, I will talk to you about this uh, publication uh, of, from this year. Uh, this is the full title, Functional Significance of Microbial Diversity in Arid Soils, Biological Soil Crust and Nitrogen Fixation as a Model System. I want to highlight the list of authors of this paper, particularly Alberto Barron Sandoval, the first author, and Teresa Perez Carvajal, which uh, both were uh, master students when they started uh, collaborating or leading uh, this uh, this work. And I'm happy to say that now Alberto is a PhD student in UC Irvine, and my uh, colleagues, uh, authors of the papers, also Jennifer Martini from UC Irvine, Stephen Bollock at CICESA here in Mexico, and Alfonso Leija and Georgina Hernandez at UNAM as well. So uh, the plan for this presentation today is to uh, go through these uh, topics or uh, uh, points of the paper that I want to highlight. First, I want to talk about a little bit about the uh, diversity and function relationship uh, in uh, microbes, particularly in prokaryotes and some key concepts that uh, led to the, the, this study. Uh, first, uh, I'm sure that many of you are aware that microbial diversity is responsible for uh, most of, or all biogeochemical bio transformations in all ecosystems. But still, we are debating how impactful community composition really is in ecosystem functions. Why? Well, because of functional redundancy, uh, which means that different phylogenetic groups conduct similar functions in ecosystems. These have uh, at least this implication uh, that when different communities are placed under the same environmental conditions, we or uh, many uh, of us have assumed that these communities make function equally. But uh, we have also uh, reflected on that uh, the degree of to which functions and compositional changes are related in these communities may depend on the function in particular, or the function of interest, which might be carried out by a broad or narrow range of co-occurring taxa. For instance, nitrogen fixation is a narrow function uh, for which 
uh, not so many phylogenetic groups uh, um, are capable of fixing nitrogen. In contrast, the composers or carbon mineralization uh, groups uh, are uh, part of a broad um, functional um, functional uh, group. Uh, also, uh, thinking about these concepts uh, and functional significance of diversity, we uh, we pose in this uh, study that the likelihood of detecting the relationship between composition and functional processes increases when looking at functionally narrow processes such as nitrogen fixation and among highly specialized communities on this on distinct environments uh, meaning that communities that have been exposed to contrasting uh, conditions uh, for a very long time like evolutionary times so uh, with these concepts in mind we looked for a model system where we can test or evaluate this relationship between diversity and function. And our model system is the arid soils and microbial communities that, are, that live in biocrusts. So arid and semi-arid ecosystems are uh, very abundant in our planet and will become uh, more and more abundant with climate change. They represent 45% of the planet's terrestrial surface. And there, bioprost, which are microbial communities, cover 70% of the interplant spaces, which is a lot. And not only they cover a lot of space, but they're the, the major or main nitrogen and carbon fixers in these ecosystems. And they, rep, they fix 30% of the global biologically fixed nitrogen. So it's uh, considerable. So the impact of uh, microbial diversity in these soils, uh, the impact, the functional impact might be, uh, might be quite uh, considerable. So these are the biocrusts. This is um, like a cartoon of a biocrust in some sort of uh, sequential or succession sequence. Uh, going from cyanobacteria dominated crust, which, is, which are uh, very thin layers uh, dominated by cyanobacteria, uh, but there can be also uh, mosses, lichens, and uh, they can evolve or uh, success uh, into very complex um, uh, structures. Uh, so this can be a succession or also there are uh, biocrust in different arid and uh, semi-arid uh, soils that they're characterized by being only cyanobacteria dominated and they never reach this um, this uh, big uh, structures on your uh, right hand side. So uh, we were looking for cyanobacteria dominated crusts because cyanobacteria are the main nitrogen fixers and we were looking for nitrogen fixation as a function of interest. Uh, also, uh, we were looking for relatively simple in terms of composition, a microbial community, so we can really characterize composition and relate that to uh, the uh, function of interest. So uh, this is the one of the sites that we uh, sampled, and I am putting this picture on just to show you how thin these, um, these crust are, and also to, to show you this uh, tiny, filaments of cyanobacteria to which uh, uh, soil particles are, are attached uh, because of the uh, polymers that cyanobacteria secrete. So these are our bioprost, the cyanobacteria dominated ones. And I want to tell you a little bit more about how uh, the relationship between bioprost, the environment and function. Uh, bioprost are metabolically active only when they're wet. Uh, they, uh, they're they different in composition uh, when you look at the co hot and cold deserts. Uh, the hot deserts are, receive rain during summer and the cold deserts receive win uh, rain during winter. So that means that when uh, biocrusts are metabolically active, they experience uh, different temperatures. Uh, so rainy seasons temperatures are likely to be an important factor in biocrust functioning. So then we uh, we thought about our the approach to evaluate this relationship, and 
we uh, went for a reciprocal transplant of biocrust experiment, uh, both in the field and in laboratory settings. Uh, the rationale is based on a paper that was also published in FEMS Microbiology Ecology a while ago by Reed and Martini. And the rationale of this reciprocal uh, tra transplants and the scenarios that we were like expecting or, or the possible outcomes are in these graphs, uh, we, uh, we see the different communities, the dark and the light community mark uh, uh, here as dots and lines and different environments. And at the same time, uh, the measure of a functional parameter, let's say nitrogen fixation. So the first scenario is that origin or composition of the communities is the main driver of the, of the variation in the functional parameter, which means that independently of the environment where the communities are placed, are placed the, the functional parameter doesn't change and it's specific to the community. A second scenario is where the environment plays the main role in, uh, in the functional parameter response. And lastly, is the, both uh, the community or the origin of the community and the environment both played a role in the response in terms of function of the communities. So uh, we went uh, to uh, sample uh, the, this crust in two contrasting environments, both are semi-arid uh, ecosystems. One is in uh, this part, northern part of Mexico, in the central northern part of Mexico, is Cuatro Cienegas in the state of Coahuila. This is a hot desert. And the other desert is a cold desert, is in Baja, in the uh, western uh, nor northwestern side of, uh, of Mexico. So there are their samples. Uh, we brought them to the lab. Uh, and we incubated them in different, uh, in contrasting temperatures. Uh, this is just to show you the contrasting temperatures uh, where the where the different deserts receive uh, precipitation. In the top side, you can see uh, highlighted in uh, red the rainy season, and the line, uh, the red line indicates the temperature uh, corresponding to the different seasons. And you can see that the me median temperature in the rainy season in Cuatro Cienegas in the hot desert is around 30 degrees. And in contrast, for the uh, cold desert, the median temperature in the, in the rainy season is around 15 degrees Celsius. So where, which were our hypotheses and expectations? Well. Uh, given that nitrogen fixation, which is our function of interest, is a taxonom is a, a is a narrow taxonomic function, and also the potential of the biocross uh, specialization to the specific hot and cold desert, we were uh, we think that communities will not be functionally redundant, and that we could actually see that. But additionally. Uh, we were expecting that nitrogen fixation would be higher when the crusts experience temperatures similar to their native environment due to this um, uh, specialization or, or legacy effects. Uh, also, we were expecting that taxonomic and functional gene composition of the crust will respond to non-native environment in an origin-dependent way, the legacy effect, and finally, that gene richness would decrease when crust were exposed to non-native environmental conditions due to this also specialization and legacy effect. What, what was our experimental design to put this hypothesis and expectation to test? Well, we went to the deserts. Uh, we took the samples uh, in quadrats. On the, on the B figure uh, is the Baja uh, desert. And on the C figure is the Cuatro Cienegas Desert. So it's cold and hot, uh, hot deserts. Then we took the samples with these uh, li little white devices, which are uh, like a small soil uh, cores or cakes of soils. And we transplanted them from Baja to uh, Coahuila and back. Um, so we planted 16 cores of each of the, 
of the of the of the samples, and also we did control course like auto like self transplanting to to control for for the uh, manipulation of the samples, uh, and then or, or we also brought uh, the cores into the lab and incubated them in fifth in fifteen degrees and in thirty degrees as the median temperatures for the hot and and cold deserts. For the transplants, we uh, maintained the transplants in the reciprocal sites for four months during the rainy season, summer or winter, as uh, so the samples could experience <coughs> the temperature and the and the and be metabolically active. So uh, we could see some sort of uh, uh, composition changes and also functional changes. And then we pulled all the, the samples back into the lab to do uh, measurements. And for the lab setting, we follow up the, the responses and the changes in composition for 180 days. Uh, we sampled at different times, at 10 days and then at 90 days and at uh, 180 days. So it was a T, the T0, T1, T2, and T3. And for both experiments or for both uh, experimental approaches, we characterize community composition. For the field experiment, we uh, did 16SR NA gene amplicons and metagenomes. And for the laboratory setting, we conducted a, a cheerful piece of the NIFH gene. And for the measurement of functioning or the functional response, we performed an acetylene reduction assay for nitrogen fixation potential. So the results of these experiments, we, uh, we presented them in three categories. One was the functional responses of the crust, uh, the other the compositional responses of the crust, and then the richness responses of the crusts. For the first part, the functional responses, uh, I will try to convince you that we demonstrate that the, given the nitrogen fixation and taxonomic narrowness uh, and potential cross specialization, communities were not functionally redu redundant. And in addition, nitrogen fixation uh, was higher when the crust experienced temperature similar to nat native environment. And this you can see in the following uh, results and graphs. Uh, here we see the, um, the graph that uh, corresponds to that uh, hypothesis on the paper of Reed and Martini, uh, where we compare the functional parameter, in this case, uh, the, the rate uh, or, or the, the effectiveness or, of the acetylene reduction assay and the response in that in that sense for both the cold desert and the hot desert in the reciprocally transplanted site for each one. The hot desert is in dark and the cold desert is in uh, light uh, gray. So we see that for, well, I have to say the uh, here we lost uh, a lot of the samples uh, in the transplanting. So we cannot, uh, have this part of the graph, we could not do that, but still we could uh, uh, conduct some uh, statistics. And we what we can see is the potential of nitrogen fixation depended on both the origin or composition and site or environment and for both main effects. So is the third scenario of those hypotheses. For the laboratory setting, and after a period of acclimation, communities showed higher pot functional potential when placed under similar temperatures to their place of origin. This is particularly clear for the final time point where, where we measure this. And so you can see for the hot desert, which is this, uh, the, the dark uh, dots and lines, uh, it is, uh, they perform better in their native temperature compared to the cold desert, which is the, the light gray, and the light and the light gray perform better in their na native temperature, which is uh, 15 degrees Celsius. 
for the second part of the results in terms of compositional responses, uh, we see that both taxonomic and functional gene composition responded to non-native environments in an origin dependent way or the legacy effects. And here I, I will show, I, I am showing you uh, the results from the reciprocal transplant, transplant experiment. In the left hand side, you can see in um, circles, the hot desert samples. Uh, the original samples are in dark and the post transplant samples are in light gray. Uh, for the cold desert, the, the, the dark and, and light is the same. The dark is the original and the, and the gray is the post-transplant experiment. But this, in, in this case, there are the triangles. So you, what you can see is that uh, despite the time uh, for, of the transplant, composition do not converge between hot and cold deserts. They, they're, they're, they're still more similar, similar uh, among them than between them. Uh, and uh, well, that's that. So they preserve or they're, they're restricted by their orig original composition. They do not converge. And you can see the same thing in, a, in another way in the right hand side uh, graph, which is a uh, clustering. Uh, you see uh, on the, on the uh, top part, the, um, the clustering of the OTUs and in the and in the um, vertical part you see the samples that are color coded for uh, cold deserts in blue the dark is the original samples and the light is the post transplant experiment the same thing for the red the red is it for the cold desert so you can see a clear uh, separation in composition in terms of OTUs between hot and cold deserts, and uh, the composition is actually mixed between uh, original and, um, and post-transplant for the cold desert and, and not so, so a mix for the hot desert. Same thing, but maybe not so clear. I want to uh, just uh, highlight that these results are for 16S, and this is for the NIF HTRFLP, so it's a little less resolution maybe. And for the lab experiment, uh, you we, we could not see that clear cut uh, difference uh, in time two and in, in time one and time two, but eventually at 180 days, composition again uh, uh, returns to the ori to the uh, origin in a way, no? Uh, the hot desert is more similar to the hot desert and the cold desert is more similar in composition to the cold desert. So uh, by the end of the experiment, origin and temperature accounted for almost 30% of the variation in uh, composition. And finally, uh, for richness responses in the crust, we uh, found that in fact, taxonomic and functional re gene richness decreased when uh, Biocrosts were exposed to non-native environmental condition, and and we see this uh, particularly, or we could see this for the for the field experiment. Uh, just very quickly to wrap this up, um, on the on the left is the 16S uh, gene richness, and on the right are different uh, nitrogen cycling pathways uh, richness. So in both cases, we compare the original and the post-transplant samples. Uh, and you can see that actually in, in most cases, well, for 16S, uh, the, the diversity declines when, uh, when the samples are transplanted to the reciprocal uh, transplant experiment as we expected from the a legacy effect idea. And this is also true, not for all, for but for many uh, of the nitrogen cycling um, uh, pathways. So uh, for our conclusions of these uh, results, I would like, I, I hope you are convinced and if not, uh, I will be happy to answer any questions. Hot and cold desert biocrust are not functionally redundant. They function differently. 
they have different composition. Natural fixation potential results strongly suggest that ecological specialization may account for this non-functional redundancy in response to environmental changes understood as these uh, contrasting environments and uh, put to test with the reciprocal transplants both in the field and in the lab. And both compositional and functional responses show evidence of these legacy effects or the site origin uh, effect. So once again, I want to acknowledge our, the students involved in this project, Alberto and Teresa, our colleagues, Jennifer, Stephen, and Georgina, and other technical uh, support that, uh, that helps very much. This is Alberto, this is Teresa, and uh, the funding for this project is this. With that, I will I end and happy to join the conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And yeah, thank you also, Emily, Nicholas, and we'll continue here with a little bit of uh, questions. We have a bit of time uh, still before we need to uh, tune out. Uh, the, while I'm sorting through the Q&A, a quick question for you, Anna. I'm thinking of with the transplantation experiments, if you would disrupt the soil, how long does it take for a new bio crust to form? So what's the time? And that of course would also indicate, I mean, how long after transplantation would you maybe see a shift in the community that got transplanted? Well, uh, I think I have two parts of a response to that question. Uh, if the crust is like destroyed, it can take a hundred years. To, to be restored because the, the growth of the microbes is very, very slow, um, particularly to reconstruct the network that's, that cyanobacteria, uh, the mesh that they form, it takes a long time. Uh, but we did not destroy the structure of the crusts. We actually did this core uh, um, sampling to preserve the structure. And then we put that very carefully in a, in a like a dialysis uh, bag, uh, so we could like deposit that in the in the soil, like like a tiny little cake. So uh, we we were really careful with that. So yeah. So it's more of how that transplanted community is going to survive under now very contrasting conditions. Sorry, I did. I didn't get the first part of the question. In a sense, it's really how the transplanted community that is still as an intact uh, bio crust with the species interactions in there is going to survive now under very different contrasting conditions. Um, I think they will survive. Um, I don't know. Well, it will be interesting to go and keep sampling uh, what uh, what's going on. But unfortunately, since they're like exposed to the natural environment, uh, they're probably just like with a they're, they're cows and rabbits and uh, animals that go around. So uh, maybe if you like cage cage it, you can mm -hmm. actually follow up uh, uh, more. We did not do that. It will okay. be interesting to be like, how much uh, time does it take to like be part of the reciprocal biocrosts uh, in the yeah. soil? Interesting yeah. question. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a question from Emily regarding the actinomycetes that you're seeing and uh, Again, they are, of course, known to be quite sensitive uh, to uh, low pH, and you often see the shift of, of proteobacteria, actinobacteria diminishing, the acidobacteriota coming up as that pH goes down. So this is a question of how you fungi then also prefer the low pH condition. So how do you still have so many actinomycetes? Are they just different species that really prefer low pH or what do you know about them? Um, hmm, that's an interesting question also for me to think about. Um, 
Yeah, um, I haven't really thought about it much so far, but uh, we basically found, yeah, basically an increase in with water limitation and the pH slightly declined as well with underwater limitation. I don't know if that could have maybe uh, stimulated also the growth of the actinobacteria under water limitation. Mm. But nevertheless, water limitation alone, so changes in the moisture were still uh, more uh, relevant for the community as compared to the pH changes. The second, nevertheless, uh, uh, environmental factor, uh, which was mainly uh, affecting the community, was indeed pH. And actually, thinking of your conclusions, and you were just mentioning not major shifts in the relative abundance. Uh, bacteria versus fungi. What about absolute? Do you have way of knowing? And again, this is, of course, also this question of changes in uh, just soil organic matter or nitrogen or so on. How much of that could be biomass decline as well? I mean, do you have absolute numbers of, of actually bacterial and fungal biomass? Um, <clears throat> yeah, we have actual numbers. Um, we always compared, uh, so the, the, the ratio basically, did it really change with water limitation? That's what you're asking. Yeah. yeah. During water limitation experiment, yeah, we didn't change, we didn't observe this. Okay, and I have a question for Nicholas. Uh, again, in terms of shifts in or potential shifts in microbial community and also grazing, do you see a shift in the plant community that could then be the driver of the associated microbiota? Yes, definitely. And there's been uh, a lot of work in these, in these prairie restorations by others and us on, on how the plant community shifts. Um, with age, like I said, we tend to see a, a decline in richness um, and more dominance by grasses, particularly warm season C4 grasses um, at the expense of, of forbs. Um, some of our early work in bison just the first few years uh, seems like there, that, that intended effect of suppressing grasses and grass competition, allowing other uh, forbs to spread seems to be happening, and particularly legumes may be responding positively. Some of our um, new data suggests that. So there's certainly the shift in the plant community going on, um, which we expect them to be part of the the probably part of the reason we're seeing these effects in, in, in microbial changes too, if that's resulting in changes in, you know, the makeup of root exit dates that are going in or the makeup of the, of the litter that ultimately is, is on the ground. Um, a lot of that litter will sit there for a whole year or even in, in the burn years, then it's, you know, uh, transformed into ash that, that has a lot of inputs for, for microbes in the soil. So there is a lot of turnover happening both across time along that chrono sequence uh, but we are starting to see shifts in the plant community because of uh, of bison impacts. Yeah, I was wondering also in terms of shift with um, responses of plants to grazing, where they might produce more phenolic compounds or so on. And of course, now the litter quality changes as a consequence of grazing. Is that anything that you've looked at? We haven't looked at. That's certainly something I've been thinking about too. Of, um, wanting to be able to look at at a, at a finer scale at those, um, yeah, at how those changes and and the plants might then be changing inputs that affect uh, the microbes too. Um, certainly, a lot of these um, the grasses, a lot of these grasses obviously evolved with grazers. Um, you know, they're they re they can respond very positively post grazing and regrow. But yeah, we I expect there to be changes in the. Um, I'm really curious about about the root exudate changes too. Okay. And let's see, I'm looking at this. This is one uh, question on what are the implications of changes in soil microbial community structure under water stress for ecosystem resilience? And actually, I'd like to expand that to the all three of you in terms of, okay, yes, we can see shifts or so on, the question of redundancy. So even if all the species are different, do they still do the same thing? So does it matter? And so how would you put all of this really into this context of how resilient is the community to whether that is uh, water stress or grazing stress or then this uh, aridity uh, and, and changes in temperature. So maybe Emily, you can go first. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, Basically, we have thought about it a lot, and it's interesting that basically in our mesocosm study, uh, this is similarity between uh, of the community continued to occur. So the, the basically the the community continued to diversify under the water treatments over time, and um, this basically means um, yeah the the, the the community is able to sustain water limitation because we still continue to find microbes in it. Nevertheless, the functioning uh, probably changes. I mean, we didn't study functioning directly in this specific study, but uh, of course uh, we saw a so shift in, uh, in specific communities of bacteria. And so what is expected is that potentially the, the functions, the critical functions provided by the microbiome in the soils will be altered and this will then create problems for ecosystems. Um, unless there are then changes, for example, uh, in terms of the climate, that uh, there will be fewer droughts if we really do some mitigation efforts. Yeah. So that was my answer for now. Okay. Yeah. Nicholas, why don't you continue? Um, you know, one one thing I've been curious about is. If in years where we may find uh, face drought stress in this environment, if it changes uh, grazing patterns, that because these animals have access to a pretty large area, you know, hundreds of hectares in size, uh, they have a lot of choice of where they particularly graze. And if they seek out lower lying areas that maybe aren't facing as much drought stress as upland areas where the um, and these sandy soils can become really dry during drought years, that could sort of amplify those potential grazing effects in very specific areas and. Um, and you know, add sort of an additional level of that heterogeneity by heterogeneity by changing grazing pressure at a really fine scale, um, and maybe again drive even further these differences that we're seeing of potential grazing impacts on the on the soil microbial community. Um, at the same time, the site we're working at, you know, the benefit of it all being a relatively local compact site is that, you know, the the sites are at most a couple kilometers apart, so they generally face the same um, weather every uh, during throughout the year. So um, it limits our ability to look at a given year of say, you know, a wet and dry site because they all tend to be wet in the same year or they all tend to be dry in the same year. Okay. Uh -huh. I may have a, can I ask a couple of questions? Um, sure, yeah. I, this is, a, I guess it will be both for Emily and Nicholas. Um, what do you think about how long the like ex ex follow up experiments uh, should be should be followed? Because, for instance, uh, I followed my experiment for for months or one hundred and eighty days, and uh, Emily did the mesocosms for a, it was a year or something like that, two years, uh, and well, Nicholas has a follow up for. Uh, many years. So I guess it depends on the questions, of course. Uh, do you ever feel that uh, you get to have a final answer of like, now we, we know that this uh, community is restored or it just adapted or when do you stop and when do you actually feel comfortable when saying, well, now? Just like a philosophical question, I think, but uh, it, it's something that I always think about. What do you think? Emily, go ahead. You answer first. <laughs> yeah, so actually the mesocosm study uh, that I presented today was the results of one year. We continued also the mesocosm study for a longer time. Um, the results were similar in the sense that the community continued to diversify over time. And at the end, uh, we decided to end the experiment with uh, with leaving the trees die and checking out what the community changes in the soils would be. And of course, uh, it was a metacosm experiment with small trees. It would have been really great to keep it for a longer time uh, and maybe let the trees grow a bit more. Then we pro probably would have had to transplant them to bigger pots. And I think um, using like one basically can 
have different types of experiments in combination, I think that's probably going to be the best way of understanding mechanisms, like combining small scale experiments, such as the mesocosm experiment, but also the mesocosm in the field, uh, sorry, the, the field experiments or in studies, what Nick has done and transplantation also is definitely a great tool for certain ecosystems, for most ecosystems, I would say. So I think it's really important to stress um, this that we need more experiment in the field, but also more longer term term observations and the combination of everything together plus modeling <laughs> will really be beneficial to get a better understanding. But I think it's difficult to really talk about the best scales. I would say um, depends on the research questions that one mm -hmm. needs to answer. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would echo that. I, I was struck too by our, our three talks and this this mix of experimental approach, field approaches and combinations and, and the different perspectives we get. Uh, in terms of how long to follow, I saw there was a question uh, that was posted about asking long-term changes. And I, I go back and forth over what long-term means in, in my study system that on the one hand, we're looking at sites that are three plus decades old, which seems very long-term, but these are ecosystems that are our restored sites have probably been in a similar habitat for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, and we still see even our oldest restorations that are 30 plus years old, things like root density uh, in the soil is still less than what we see in old, very old, unplowed original remnant sites. And so, although there's, you know, there's certainly this rapid turnover in the first few years that we see both in the plant community and in microbial community um, that levels off, and maybe you're not getting as much rapid change after a decade or two, um, there's still ongoing changes, and and I don't I don't know when the end point is uh, to to see that. Um, um, we other also often see sort of in the early years a, a rapid decline in um, in nitrogen as sort of that legacy of, of fertilization I mentioned goes away, and then over the long term, um, total soil nitrogen may slowly increase again as as organic matter is is in, uh, is in the soil more in the soil, and um, that root density tends to build too. So there are just long term changes that may take many decades, if not centuries, to really um, to play out. Yeah, I agree. So I think uh, I want to wrap up with one final question here from the Q&A, and this is about viruses. So given that soil viruses are known to be highly sensitive to environmental condition variations, are you considering investigating whether they could account for some of the shifts in microbial community uh, I mean, affecting both bacteria and fungi. And I, I know, I mean, this is going forward because uh, none of you had looked at the fung uh, the viral uh, communities, but they are microbes too, and of course, major influencers. Any thoughts? Well, yes, uh, which, I mean, it's not that I'm going to do it, but it will be great to collaborate with someone that uh, has uh, experience on viruses that are, yes, they're microbes, but they're like their behavior and all the techniques to uh, study them are like very different. And they're definitely uh, drivers of both ecology and evolution. So they, they're part of the show and should be included. That's my comment. Yeah, I'd also love to look at this. I'm in a department with a lot of virologists who bring this up a lot. And my answer is often, I I don't know. That's a great idea. We should look into it. I think that could be a really, um, just another additional ecological interaction that we haven't considered yet and, and what might be helping to shape these uh, the composition of these communities. And of course, I think also plant viruses that then interact with the uh, prairie plants. So. Yeah, absolutely. Emily, any added thoughts? I, I totally agree with all of the comments made. Yes, definitely important topic to, to consider. And this, of course, might be a topic for our next webinar. Mm -hmm. So I will take a look at, uh, at papers, and we're probably going to continue in the spring again with, with a new topic. So uh, please keep be posted. But no, I think we need to wrap up. So. Uh, 
Thank you, Emily. Nicholas, Anna, it was wonderful to hear from you and hear more about uh, the studies that you had uh, published on. And again, thank you everyone in the audience from really what I saw all over the world. Uh, and again, if you missed parts of this, uh, the uh, uh, webinar will be available on the uh, under sites at both uh, VFMs and OUP uh, probably in a week or two. And of course, there you can also catch any of the previous webinars if you miss them. So again, there's information. And of course, you have links to the paper so you can read more. So, so again, uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, I will see you again at our next webinar. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Max.